Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Infineon with Kim Lee. We're going to talk today about new approaches to sensors and sensing. Kim, what's changing in sensors and what's changing in how they're being used? Sensors are becoming more intelligent. The industry, consumers are actually wanting more intelligence from the sensors, especially when we're talking about these new things like uh, smart IoT, smart home, smart buildings, smart this, smart that. Consumers want everything more digitized, more electrification, more civilization in their in their environment, in their world. And sensors are the first step in providing that, combined with microcontrollers and software algorithms that build the intelligence for these sensors is what's making sensors more appealing to customers, uh, providing better capabilities, uh, more intelligent capabilities, making it uh, smarter, and with the new things like AI, machine learning, integrated into the algorithms into the software to enable sensors, it creates a whole different use case for a lot of things that we wouldn't have realized in the past. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Kim, what are we looking at? So we're looking at a radar transceiver implementation. And radar, traditionally, as, as everyone knows, it's started with the defense and military transitioning to automotive and safety. And now we're seeing radar being used in consumer applications. With the miniaturization of radar and being able to make RF uh, a lot easier to design for a lot of design engineers that are not used to doing RF, uh, we've enabled um, use cases in consumer products that really go from digital to digital. In this particular case, here's an example of one of our radar transceivers, our MIMICS, that are basically uh, very small chip-based uh, radar um, devices that basically project an output at a certain frequency, uh, have that radar signal reflect off an object or multiple objects and uh, received back in to get processed. In this particular case, it's a 60 gigahertz radar. It can range anywhere from a few gigahertz to many gigahertz. But in this particular case, in our implementation, 60 gigahertz is a, is a good sweet spot. It's, it's within a, a license-free band within FCC. And it also provides a lot of resolution in terms of what you want to see. In this particular case, here's an example of a chip that we have that is basically the chip here and the antennas in the package here. Uh, and we have different versions of that, which are actually a lot smaller, different variations from two transmit and, and four receives. But the idea is basically being able to process the, the data from what you're seeing visually in the field. In the past, this was pretty much a very large system that was quite costly, right? Is this just Moore's Law that, that shrunk down, or is there more to it? Um, it's a little of both. It's Moore's Laws that have, have shrank, it down, shrank down the uh, the, die, the size, but it's also the technology. We're able to now put antennas in package, which hasn't been uh, an easy thing to do with new innovation materials, being able to uh, packaging innovations, and being able to facilitate antennas at that frequency that requires a lot of matching uh, know-how, requires a lot of being able to engineer that into a small, almost lossless type um, um, form factor, and we've accomplished that, and that's what's allowing us to miniaturize these uh, radar transceivers. You've got a lot of, of elements here that are really showing up in 5G and 6G too, right? Basically, where you put the antennas in the package, how they're exposed, uh, as well as how you uh, make sure that the signal integrity is still there, right? That's correct. That's correct. At, at, at a millimeter wave, it's a whole different ball game than than regular RF and RF, um, you know, two point four gig to what you see in, in Wi-Fi and even in five G technologies, where you're looking at up to about uh, seven gigahertz in, in in today's and tomorrow's cellular standards. This is uh, basically twenty four gig or sixty gigahertz, which is a different spectrum altogether, which requires a lot more uh, loss maintenance. With the antennas that were, were are being put into mobile phones for cellular bands and Wi-Fi, that can be done on FR4 copper, whereas these require a lot more controlled dielectric materials such as uh, Rogers and uh, with certain dielectric constants that are amenable to millimeter wave. You've also got a lot of, of sensors now that are being combined in different ways than they were in the past, right? You have the capability now of looking at all sorts of different things. Where else does this go? Uh, sensor fusion is a big thing that um, is, is happening in the industry, and we're a big part of that, being able to offer for specific use cases where, like, say, for cameras, 
for um, uh, doorbells that are utilizing cameras, right? Well, one example would be the cameras uh, has an SOC, has camera electronics, has power, it could be battery operated, but battery maintenance and power consumption is one of the big deals in, in, in consumer products. And having a sensor that is able to uh, consume very low power and when it's intelligently detecting something that a camera wants to see, turning on the camera and being able to then say, okay, I, I see a human presence that, I, that, that seems suspect. I want to turn on the camera. I want to turn on the SOC. I want to start communicating uh, wirelessly to, to uh, my mobile phone to see what's going on. That consumes a lot of power. If I'm, if I'm turning on power uh, needlessly with a squirrel going by in the scene or something that's flying that I don't really care about, it's wasting power. So this is more about power uh, mitigation and, and prolonging battery life. And that's another use of using intelligent sensors. One of the changes here is that we're also starting to get into some of the acoustic sensing too, right, that goes with this. How is that being applied? Um, it's being applied in parallel. Acoustic sensing is one of the big things with microphones and being able to hear and, and, and have sound classification, like gunshots and a cry for help, and being able to determine whether or not is, is this, how legitimate is this? One of the things we're doing is having, for example, a glass break detection as a good example, right? You can have a glass break at a certain acoustic spectrum. Uh, if you're in a room and, 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 and let's say, uh, for security reasons, uh, somebody tries to break in the house and breaks the glass, then you, you cause an actual pressure event in the room because of that momentary exposure of the glass break. So let's say if we fuse that sound along with that pressure event, as an example, we could say that uh, more reliably, that's an actual intrusion as opposed to, let's say, a wine glass dropping on the floor. And those are an, an example where radar, for example, can also be fused with a microphone to give better um, occupancy and presence sensing for an actual event. Whether it's, uh, you hear the event, is it an actual person? What are you seeing from a radar standpoint? Is it enough to, ju enough to justify turning on a camera and consuming more electronic power? And the sensors have gotten sensitive enough as well so that you can start doing Doppler effects too, right? Right. As, as a matter of fact, uh, what radar is doing here is, is basically, in this particular case, we're doing uh, presence sensing. We're doing uh, understanding whether or not there's a person in the room or not. For that example that I mentioned earlier, it's basically acquiring a target, applying math, applying specific uh, algorithms and filtering to determine whether or not it, it's an actual person uh, in the room or in the field of view and how it's moving and looking at that movement. In this particular case here, we're looking at the range Doppler of a uh, uh, person walking. You can see the, the feet movement, the torso movement, and being able to classify whether or not that person's moving left, right, or how it's moving. And then from there, you can actually kind of look outward and see, okay, these are p actual people moving in the field of view. So you can target. This is one of the GUIs that we have, for example, the graphic user interfaces that we use in our radar system to identify specific targets in, a, in an area. Where else are you seeing big changes? What other kinds of, of sensors are, are developing that didn't exist before or existed before and have completely changed? Yeah, one example is uh, environmental sensing, being able to sensor the, env uh, sense the environment. Air quality is being becoming a more, uh, is more of a concern nowadays, especially being able to understand what air, what air quality is around you. And uh, gas sensing is, is certainly something we see a lot of innovation with. So what are we looking at here? So we're looking at an uh, innovation that um, has been uh, recently uh, put into a consumer product for CO2 sensing as a, as a gas sensing, again, monitoring air quality uh, in a given environment. In this particular case, it's using uh, photoacoustic spectroscopy. Uh, and what that really is, is basically, uh, basically be, uh, being able to uh, listen to the molecules that are in a specific isolated tank. What we're doing here in this particular case where we use an uh, infrared light source that is projecting light through a filter that's tuned to CO2. And what we're doing is we're, we're, we're basically heating up the, the, the CO2 molecules within the tank. And when you heat those up, they resonate. And they resonate. And when they resonate, they have a certain sound. And all we're doing is adding using our MEMS technology to uh, basically listen, very simply listen to the acoustic noise of those molecules resonating within the tank. And from that, we're able to determine very accurately the PPM count 
within that environment and then use that to uh, show what is the typical CO2 count in the room. So basically what you're doing is you've gotten to the point where your filters are now accurate enough to be able to say this is different than what's over here before. Correct, yes. Mm -hmm. Through a lot of engineering and innovation, we um, uh, have isolated that, especially for CO2. It's a very easy gas that we can apply filtering and apply the specific uh, innovation that we can really uh, miniaturize this into, uh, you know, something. I mean, CO2 has been, around, at least monitoring, has been around for a while. So to get an accurate reading and be able to meet uh, new building standards with this and, and wow. be able to even put this in consumer devices um, as opposed to uh, big HVAC systems. Uh, the innovation is what is enabling those particular use cases. So you've gotten a lot more granular with what you can see than what you could in the past, correct? Yes, yes. The accuracy is a lot more um, uh, in, in terms of percentage for PPM is a lot more accurate than what we had in the past. So basically what you can do now is you can take that data and apply it to other data with machine learning or AI and interpret what that means if there's a trend out there. Is that correct? That is correct. Ed. Um, what we can do is use, uh, put, like say for, this, for example, the CO2 sensor in a room uh, over days, weeks, whatever the case is, and monitor the historic cycle of CO2 as, as um, over time as people are using the room. So you get some kind of history as far as what, let's say, you can predict for energy maintenance and, and so forth, and combine that with other sensors for motion, for occupancy, uh, and air quality to determine more accurately people counting in the room, for example, and those type of things which allow us to adjust the lighting, adjust the HVAC, and do things that will make, will save us more energy in the long run. So in addition to getting smaller, the response time has gotten faster and the data is more accurate. That is correct, yes, all three. So these used to be pretty large systems and they were pretty clunky in the past. What does it look like today? Yeah, what it looks like today is a very miniaturized uh, form that um, is can be put into, um, it's probably about the size of uh, half your thumbnail. And what it can be put into, it actually looks like this. If I were to, let's say, show you one of our uh, kits. This is our CO2 sensor right here. You can see that's uh, very small. And, and being that small, it can be applied to, let's say, a device like this. And this is uh, a carry-as-you-go, uh, what we call a CO2 to-go for uh, one of our partners. And you can plug this in. It's just powered off of a USB um, um, power. And it will give you a traffic light, uh, basically signaling whether or not the air is at a certain PPM level. It's basically red, yellow, green. Green, obviously, meaning it's safe. Yellow being... Um, you know, there is some CO2 concentration. You might want to start opening the windows to circulate the air. Or red, there's an unhealthy amount of CO2 in the room and, and, and either get out or, or do something um, um, that's going to circulate the air faster. This, this is another one that is basically uh, more like a kit that actually talks over um, the cloud. You can actually, it does the same thing. Uh, it also gives you historic uh, readings, and if you scan this QR code, for example, you're able to get historic uh, content of the, this sensor over a 24-hour period. So based on this uh, CO2 sensor, I mean, this is a, a kit that basically provides the CO2 data over the cloud, and if I scan this um, QR code, I can get statistics over time in... Um, in a reading that uh, for this particular sensor. What's interesting is that you can now tie this to other systems, right? So now you can say, okay, let's turn turn on the air conditioning, as you said before, but also maybe it's gotten to the point where well, we need to clear out this building. That's correct. Yeah, if we, it, 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 we tie it to other systems. Companies are doing now, uh, especially buildings, um, with the new standards being applied in California, uh, with lead and wells, uh, standards that are, uh, dictating air quality, especially CO2 concentration levels in buildings and classrooms and homes, uh, these, th these types of monitors are actually essential for being able to monitor the air and actuate if the, if the air quality is getting, uh, if the CO2 concentration is getting too high, ventilate the room uh, automatically. Uh, and this is something that 
a lot of the HVAC systems, air con systems, and, and so forth are, are implementing, integrating these uh, smarter CO2 um, sensors into their electronics. Kim, thanks for a great explanation. Yep, absolutely. You're welcome.